It is a pleasure to be here, and it's hard to believe it's been four years since we've moved from the Maritimes to the Ottawa area, and we've been back here a number of times, and every time I come back, I bring my golf clubs. But this time was a little different, and as Carmen, Pastor Carmen just said, we, uh, we attended the wedding of our son, Greg. He did his internship at Faith Tabernacle earlier this year, and uh, when he came home, he said, Dad and Mom, I feel called to the Maritimes. That's great, because when, when Wanda and I were married, we felt called to the Maritimes. We were here for 17 years. So that's great, Greg. Oh, and by the way, uh, there's this lady I've met. Her name is Brittany. And so we came down a couple of times through the summer and visited with Brittany, got to know her, and, and the wedding on Friday was beautiful. Thank you to Pastor Carmen for such a wonderful service, um, marriage ceremony. Thank you to Pastor John, is he in here somewhere? Pastor John Kurtz? There you are. Who catered the, uh, the wedding reception, excellent food, and just a, a wonderful time. And now Greg and Brittany are in Shediac, and they, uh, they should be here. They should always be in church, right? But um, they're in Shediac on their honeymoon, and we pray God's blessing upon them. It is nice to be with Pastor Carmen and his wife, Colleen, and uh, staying at Motel Crockett. <laughs> and it's not just Wanda and I and the boys, but my mom and dad are here, and uh, my brother and sister. And so some of us are staying at your place, and some of us are staying at Renee. And you and your wife, so thank you for your hospitality, and uh, we'll be heading out early tomorrow morning to head back to Ottawa as our boys go to Sir Sanford Fleming University, uh, College in, um, in Peterborough, and their exams are on Thursday, so it's been a whirlwind trip, and we're heading back quite quickly after we're done here. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, put it up in the air, or if you have your Bible on your cell phone, put your cell phone up in the air. It's always good to carry your Bible with you, amen? Turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, we're going to read just a couple of verses. Beginning at verse 53, and going to the end of verse 56. Mark chapter 6, beginning at 53, going to the end of 56, says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as, he t as touched him were made well. As I mentioned before, we pastored in the Maritimes here for 17 years and beginning in 1996, but that wasn't our first exposure or my first exposure to the Maritimes. I remember when I was about five or six years old, our family planned a summer vacation. We went somewhere different usually every year, and we planned a summer vacation, and the plan was to go to Prince Edward Island. How many of you have ever been to Prince Edward Island? Beautiful place to go camping and, and enjoy some summer vacation. Well, the plan was that we were going to go to PEI. I'm not exactly sure what area of the island that we were going. I just knew that it was going to be a vacation that was going to be further away from home than normal as we grew up in Montreal. And so we're all excited because I heard mom and dad saying, well, we're going to be going on a ferry ride. Well, I had never even been on a boat, I don't think, up to that point. And so a ferry ride that was going to take our car and our trailer. And, and I, saw, I remember dad getting maps out on the kitchen table and showing us the direction of how we were going to go and as a five or six or I can't exactly remember how old I was but there was an excitement there that we were going to Prince Edward Island. So we, we started on our trip and we had this trailer behind the car I believe that we were pulling with all of our camping gear in it 
And we were driving through Quebec and into New Brunswick and suddenly this red light comes on the dash. And you always realize that when a red light comes on on the dash of your car, it's never a good thing. And so the red light for a while, as I remember, it seemed to go on and off and, and on and off. And, and we would stop somewhere and we would get it checked out. And then we'd drive a little further and it would go on and off. And, and finally we came to an area near Fredericton. And the light came on again and it stayed on for a long time. Well, we never made it to Prince Edward Island. Unfortunately, we made it to a place called Mactaquack. <laughs> Didn't sound as exciting as Prince Edward Island to me. Mactaquack, I think it was a provincial park. We set up our tent there. And I remember as we were setting up the tent and I was looking around, I was, I was so disappointed. You couldn't see any ocean from Mactaquack. So I was so disappointed. But can I tell you this? At the end of the two or three weeks, however long we, st we stayed there, I remember that being, as a child, probably the best vacation that we ever took. You know, sometimes we make plans. And sometimes those plans don't work out exactly the way that we want them to. I know that when, when Pastor Carmen and Renee and I, when we go golfing, now this has never happened to me, but I'm sure it's happened to them, you get up to the first tee and you think to yourself, this is going to be the greatest game, I'm going to get the best score ever. I'm going to get birdies and I'm going to get pars and it's going to be a great game, that's the plan. You get up to the first tee and take your swing and it goes off in the trees. You get up to the tee, you take your first swing, and it goes in the water. Like I said, it never happens to me, but for... It doesn't always work out the way that you plan. Sometimes your vacation doesn't always work out the way that you plan. We were planning to come down here and take the trip on Boxing Day. So my dad and I, on Christmas Day, drive over to the pharmacy to pick up some prescriptions for, for my mom and to pick up a few items for the trip. So I come back out to the car, and I'm sitting in the car, and dad's still inside, and I'm sitting there just looking at my cell phone, and all of a sudden, bang! And I look in my rearview mirror, and the back window is shattered. I thought somebody had thrown something at the car, but with the cold weather, apparently a, a back window can just all of a sudden implode. And I'm thinking to myself... This isn't good. We've got to drive to New Brunswick tomorrow. So sometimes things always work out the way that, they, that you plan them. Sometimes you start a job and you think, wow, this is going to be a great job and I'm qualified and the pay is good and, and, and it's going to be just fabulous. And sometimes it doesn't always work out the way that you plan. Greg and Brittany got married on Friday. And as they're going to discover... That marriage isn't always, want to just close your ears for a minute, that marriage is not always a bed of roses. It doesn't always go the way that you hope or the way that you plan. It takes a lot of hard work. Any kind of relationship can be like that, whether it's a friendship or whether you're a parent. When you're bringing up your children, I've always wanted to make sure that I was a good dad. But it just doesn't always work out that way. Even in your spiritual life, you kneel at an altar, you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, and you say, I'm going to make some fabulous and wonderful changes in my life, and I'm going to serve God with all of my heart and soul and mind and strength, and then temptation comes and difficulties come and problems come and you think to yourself, it's not quite working out the way that I had hoped or planned. 
And sometimes we come to a point in our lives where we say to God, God, didn't you know already how this was going to turn out? And if so, why did you allow this to happen? Why did you allow that to happen? Why did you allow this situation or this circumstance to come into my life? God, if you're all-knowing why, if we put our trust in you, why do you allow this to happen in this way? Our scripture today in the book of Mark says that the disciples in the boat landed at a place called Gennesaret. But was this where they had originally planned to go? If you look back a few scripture verses, back to verse 45, it says this. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. Now some Bibles have little maps in them. But if you look at Bethsaida and Gennesaret, Bethsaida is on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, at the top, and Gennesaret is on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe not a whole lot different in the area between Mactaquac and Prince Edward Island. And what makes it difficult to understand is this. In verse 45 it says, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. He made them get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. But what was it that took them so far off course? What was it that changed their plan? What was it that changed their direction? And we find out in verses 47 and 48 that a storm came. It says, Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. And I remember sitting at some corner side garage in Fredericton and mom had taken the cooler out of the back of wherever we had stored the cooler for that trip going to PEI. She took the cooler out and I think she started to make us some sandwiches and we were sitting on this kind of this little cement thing here and the car was on the garage in the lift and I heard the mechanic come out to my dad and say, this car will never make it to Prince Edward Island. This car is not going to make it for the plans that you have made. And I remember thinking to myself in, in that childlike state and thinking, God, we prayed in our driveway before we made this trip. We prayed for safe travel and that we would make it there and that we would have a great vacation. And I remember thinking to myself as I was eating maybe a peanut butter sandwich or whatever it was that mom made me, I remember thinking, God, didn't you know this was going to happen and why would you let it happen? I want to go to PEI, I want to go on the ferry, and I want to see the ocean. Why? Why did you let this happen? I think the disciples... In the midst of the sea, in a small boat, in the middle of a storm, probably felt the same way. Jesus, we're in a storm here. You sent us out here. You made us get into the boat and go before you. Didn't you know this was going to happen? Look where we are now. Now what do we do? Watch what Jesus does, if you have your Bible still open. Look at verse 48. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, 
For they all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. I believe that Jesus Christ still does this today. He comes to people in the storms of their lives. He comes to people in the storms that happen in their workplace. He comes to people in the storms that happen in their marriages. He comes to people in the storms of their relationships. He comes to people in storms for families and parents. He comes to people in storms that have to do with sickness. And people will respond to Jesus in one of two ways when he comes to them in their storm. They will either blame him and say, God, why did you let this happen? God, I don't like being here. God, this is your fault. God, this is not what I had planned, and this is not what I want to do. God, and just put the blame on him. That's one response. The other response is that people receive him and put their trust in him, no matter what it is that they are going through. And sometimes Jesus walks into the storms of our lives like he did with the disciples. And he handles it in a different way. Sometimes, like in this instance, he actually will come and and he will calm the storm. And an answer to prayer will be that your storm or the storm that you're going through will suddenly come to an abrupt halt and you will see the hand of God transforming your situation. That's, that's sometimes that's the way that Jesus works. But other times, he will simply come to you in your storm and say, don't be afraid. I'm going to hold your hand through this storm. I'm sure Pastor Carmen has had this experience when he is working with a family through a funeral situation, the death of a loved one. When you go up to the daughter or the son or a family member and you're trying to console them and I've had several people speak to me and say, Pastor, I don't understand why I don't feel so sad. Like I I, I miss my loved one so much but I don't understand why I feel the way I feel right now. I feel so peaceful. I feel so comforted. I feel that Jesus is going to take care of everything. You see, because sometimes Jesus comes into our storms and he'll calm the storm and he'll stop the bad stuff from happening. But other times, the bad stuff will continue, but he'll give you, he'll give me, he'll give anyone that calls upon his name that will invite him into their boat. He'll say, peace be still. And he's speaking to your heart. Be comforted because I am in control. So sometimes he calms the storms, and other times he calms our hearts in the midst of the storm. Why the storm in the first place? Well, if we look at verse 52 of our text. <clears throat> after it shows that the disciples were greatly amazed beyond measure and marveling. It says this, For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts, their heart was hardened. It takes us back earlier in the chapter to verse 32 when 
We read about the feeding of the 5,000, which is actually probably more like the feeding of the 20,000 because it says 5,000 men, but it doesn't account for women and children. 20,000 people fed with a boy's lunch. 12 baskets of leftovers. You got leftovers after Christmas? They, this, is, this is leftovers deluxe. What tends to happen in our lives because of a hardened heart? Well, if we go back to the Old Testament and think about Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened, we understand that there were some significant storms that came upon the land of Egypt. And so for the disciples, it seems that they didn't get what they wanted. They were looking to go to Bethsaida. But here's what we need to understand about storms. It's not always about the people in the boat. It's about fulfilling the will of God. It's about fulfilling the will of God. Jesus sent them before him to Bethsaida, and he went to pray. And did it not happen with Abraham and Isaac that God told Abraham to go up to the mountain and sacrifice his son? And that over a period of time, after Abraham had tied his son to the altar and was about ready to plunge the knife to kill his only son, which had been promised to him, talk about not understanding a situation that God changed things around and changed plan A into plan B. Changed PEI to Fredericton. Changed it from Isaac to the ram in the thicket. Changed it from Gennesaret, from Bethsaida to Gennesaret. Sometimes God has plans. And it's more than one plan. It's about fulfilling God's will. So what was plan B for this story that we read in Mark chapter 6? Well, the plan B was Gennesaret. It's not what the disciples expected. They had to go through a storm to get there. But look with me as we read it again from Mark chapter 6, verses 53 to 56. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. See, it wasn't about the people in the boat. It's not about you and I. It's not about what we want. Plan B was about the people of Gennesaret who needed Jesus Christ. And it's about who the storms bring to us. Because that happens. I remember just recently my mom told me a story of how she was going for a doctor's appointment and she was sitting in a waiting room. And a young woman came and sat down beside her. And for whatever reason, the waiting room that my mom was in for whatever test that she was going through was also the waiting room for women who were waiting to have an abortion. 
And so my mom and this woman are sitting side by side, and nobody wants to be in a hospital, period, right? Unless you work there. Nobody wants to be in a hospital. No one wants to be sitting in a waiting room. That's not what people plan to do with their lives, with their day. But on that day when my mom was sitting beside a woman who was about to have an abortion, God allowed that conversation, that storm, to produce something that was positive. As she began to speak about the importance of life and the miracle of birth. I wish I could stand here and say that the woman walked out that day her friend came over and, and they went to another part of the waiting room. And, and so I don't know. I just pray that God would have had an influence on that conversation. I remember another instance when I was driving home from Halifax. We were pastoring in Lockport. And I was kind of in a hurry and we were getting ready to go somewhere or do something. And all of a sudden my car dies. I had a little Nissan Sentra. And the car dies right around between exit 6 and 7, just past 10 Talon. I'm thinking to myself, man, this just is the worst possible time. I can't understand why, God, why would you allow this to happen? Not even, you know, not even going to get into the fact that it might cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars to fix whatever's wrong with the car. God, I just... I'm having a real problem with this. So I call CAA and the tow truck comes and they put my car up under the flatbed and I'm still kind of steaming, still kind of fuming and I get into the truck and to start a conversation with the tow truck driver to find out that he was the son of a fellow that went to the church in Lockport. And we began talking about the Lord and I had the privilege of leading that guy to the Lord right in the cab of his tow truck. You see, folks, it's not about us. It's about what the circumstances of life, it's about what the storms of life may bring to us and how God can use those for his purposes, just like he did for the people of Gennesaret. And I can imagine the disciples getting out of the boat and thinking, man, why did this storm and Jesus, didn't he know? And, and we're not supposed to be here, we're supposed to be in Bethsaida. And suddenly they start to see what Jesus is doing with the people of Gennesaret and healing them and touching them and ministering them and they're flooding in from all over the place and suddenly they think to themselves, now I know. Now I know. Are you going through a storm today? Are you going through a situation that's kind of ticking you off? Have you had a conversation with God lately and said to him, God, I really don't like what's going on here. Maybe it's your job, maybe it's your family, maybe it's, it's, it's a circumstance. Have you had that type of conversation with God lately? God... I don't like this storm. Well, if God is leading you to plan B, here's what you need to do. Look at verse 53 for a moment once again. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. They didn't say to one another, don't bother throwing down the anchor. We're, we're going to be out of here as soon as possible because we want to go over that way. As soon as they got there, they anchored. Even though it wasn't where they wanted to go, they anchored. Even though Mac to Quack wasn't where we wanted to go, we started pounding the tent stakes into the ground on the campsite. We anchored there. And because they decided they were going to anchor in Gennesaret, they allowed God's plan to be fulfilled. Can I invite the worship team to come and join me on the platform once again? How does that saying go? 
When life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. And when God sends you or allows a storm to come into your life, put your trust in Him. Because wherever you are in your life, as long as Jesus is in your boat, everything will work out just fine. I'd like to read verses 50 and 51 once again. Think about how worried they were. The Sea of Galilee was notorious for windstorms that would just all of a sudden come up and trap people in the middle of the sea. So verse 50 says, For they all saw him as he was walking to them. They all saw him and were troubled, but immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Folks, if you're going through a storm today, Invite Jesus into the boat. Don't turn him away, get angry with him and say, why are you doing this? Just say, I don't really understand and I need your help. Come into the boat. And when he leads you through the storm and says, do not be afraid, be of good cheer, know that he is in control. And wherever he takes you, anchor there. And trust that God, that Jesus is going to do miraculous things in the lives of those around you. And instill more faith and trust in your life. I'd like if we could all bow our head and close our eyes for a moment. Without anyone looking around. 